Welcome to Hacking Music. I'm your host, John Pichotta. The goal of this podcast is to break off a piece of the hacking music training we use and train artists in every day to master the best of what other headliner artists have already figured out so that you can unlock your potential. Additionally, we interview world-class artists and entrepreneurs, doers and thinkers so that you can better analyze your problems, seize your opportunities, and master your decision-making and execution. Every episode is packed with training, lessons, and force multipliers that never expire. And if you're listening to this, you're missing out. If you'd like members-only training and exclusive content, you can join at hacking-music.com. So check out the show notes for a link. James, welcome, my friend. Thank you very much, uh, John. It's uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. Yeah, man, really been looking forward to this. So, James, you've got a really interesting backstory that I was hoping we can kind of talk through today and and have have a conversation about. Yeah, because you, you're the 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 Jimmy Page face, the kind of the I would say the center of the band, Jimmy Page. Talk a little bit about how that band came together. Is that your baby? Was it somebody else's baby? Definitely not my baby. But <laughs> the strange thing is, having only really been in the band now since, let's see, I started rehearsing with them in April of 22. My first show with them was um, late May of 22. That said, <laughs> Zoso works so much and so hard. Mm-hmm that I've done around 250 shows already with them. Wow. Just since May 22. Um, Zoso actually started life out in Huntington Beach, California. Okay. Um, they weren't from there. The singer Matt Jernigan basically is a Southern boy. He's from Jacksonville, Florida, by way of Macon, Georgia. Ended I can up kind in, of see that. Yeah, ended up in Houston and started playing with a guy named Adam uh, Sandling, bass player. Now, the two of them... Interestingly, Matt Jernigan was one of the original singers of Pantera. Huh, interesting. In the early days when they were still trying to kind of find their way. Um, he did that for, I think, a little under a year. Um, yeah. But he and Adam Sandling moved out to Huntington Beach, California, like everyone else. You know, yeah. thousands of kids across the country. They were going there to make fame and fortune, um, presumably as an original band, you know. Um, but they were they did some cover gigs and an agent saw them do a cover of Cashmere. And if you know it's just beautiful, you, by the way, the way you guys the way you guys pull that together and the whole show, it's like your yeah. your touch is really like you get in the center, you get in the middle of Jimmy Page. Thank you. Yeah. Great job. I mean, your touch, your tone, your phrasing is is really beautiful, James. Oh man, that's so sweet. Thank you. Um that song is all touch. Right. Because really, it's a very repetitive part. The The challenge with that song, there's two challenges. One is keeping your, t literally, your touch on the strings, left and right hands, just enough girth, <laughs> but not too much. Because, right. in fact, there were times I played it early on with the band where I was kind of going, <laughs> Junga gunk, you know, because part of you wants to tilt it a little towards metal. Right, it's the heavier. Not, right. It's not quite. It's zang a gang, gang gang gang, but you want to find just the right weight on those. It's more no Norwegian Odin than it is metal. You know what oh, I mean? I mean, that's the song, you know, oh, you know, complete. It's so funny because every other guitar gig in the world right now that you get, if you start. <laughs> You know, doing this. I mean, literally everyone in the band will probably jump on you and beat you up. Or they'll just be like, cheesy. No, no, no. Don't do not do that. You know, in Zosa, it's like, could you please turn up the volume on, right. on that unbelievably, uh, you know. Is that refreshing? Is that refreshing for you that you don't have oh, to be all things to all people? It's the you greatest. Just, thing. Growing up, like you many just of tip us, the hat. I wanted to be a guitar god growing up. I didn't want to just be a guitar player. Me right. and me, thousands upon thousands of other young men and women. We all wanted. I talk to women all the time who say they wanted to be Jimmy Page growing oh, really? up. Really interesting. Seriously. Um, so I get it, and I want to bring to this crowd, to to our crowds, 
something that they just don't see anymore. I mean, the closest you're likely to come might be um, maybe Jake Kiska in Greta Van Fleet, maybe Scott Holiday of Rival Sons. You know, they they have some, certainly Scott has some swagger, right. but the Zeppelin thing is a whole nother level of that. Yeah. Um, but let me get back to their origin. They started out in LA, an agent saw them do Cashmere and basically said, wow, you, and remember this is early days of the tribute thing, okay? Nine, this is 94, 95 when this right, started. Yeah. But, Tributes weren't respected or even and a they, thing. There weren't as many of them. We have so many tribute bands, just Zeppelin bands alone. It seems like every region of the country has two yeah. or three. Um, but back then you had um, the incredible Wild Child from L.A., who for me are really one of the great OG tribute bands. And they're still around. Dave Brock, the singer for that band. Uh, you may know I also portrayed Jim Morrison in a Nashville yeah. Doors Shaman's Blues. I love doing it. I feel so close to that role as well. Um, but I mean, Dave Brock, Wild Child, is just incredible. I mean, he was the singer for the Manzarek Krieger band for a while as well. Mm, wow. Just great. They were around, and a few others uh, led Zeppelin, which is the LA based Zep band. I believe they're nearly as old as Zoso, actually. They've been around a pretty long time. But with whatever bias I can get rid of, uh, Zoso has long been considered, you know, our, the press clippings this band has gotten over the years include things like head and shoulders above every other yeah. Zeppelin oh, you... the most exacting. So I actually walked into a band that was very respected. And it was a big challenge because these guys have the, over a 25 year legacy. Also, they've been working their asses off. Right. This, guys don't have some big road crew for 25 years they've basically been out there making it happen as a the, between the four of them yeah. and they love they, that hustle it's, a, it's amazing man i often yeah. say these nobody works like zoso think about it 29 years now working hard right. not oh the payoff came in and now they can all just you know go to their mansions no these guys are, you know, we're driving Penske trucks week in, week out, getting to yeah. gigs. We're part of load in. We're part of, you know, we set up our gear. I mean, we have great local crews everywhere we go, but to keep things lean on the road, we travel as a four piece. Hey everybody, it's John. Just wanted to drop in here and give a special thanks to our sponsor, Artist Works. Artist Works is an execution company. They specialize in media, marketing, and monetization. ArtistWorks partners with brands to provide infrastructure, marketing, execution, and monetization in the rapidly changing media industry. They create products and experiences to engage your customers, drive revenue, build careers, and surpass your competitors. Check them out at ArtistWorks.com. That is works with a W-E-R-X, A-R-T-I-S-T-W-E-R-X.com. Really? Others, no merch have, person. You know, do do y'all? How do you handle merch? Because we don't do merch on the road. We pick the venues where it seems like it's going to do the best. So we're a little okay. selective. At it. Also, sometimes venues want to charge a certain amount, either a percentage of your merch sales, or they want to charge you for someone to sell it. And you just sometimes have to do the numbers. This is not really my purview, but. You kind of do the numbers on whether you think that's going to make sense or not, because maybe the next night they don't charge you anything to have a seller or to sell them. And so you mm -hmm. save the shirts for that a little bit. I, it's a funny thing. The band has great merch, um, but um, I don't know. Like I said, the band has been around a long time and I walked into a situation that was well established, but I thought. And I think they thought, too, like it was time for a change. They had a wonderful guitar player, John McDaniel. John had been there for 13 years. I learned a ton from John when I, it was all very amicable. He had given them a ton of lead time and he and I had numerous Zoom conversations just like this, where we sat there with the guitar and I say, and he would say, so this is how I play that a song remains the same thing. Mm -hmm. You know, or, and I'd say, well, I play it a little like this. And I think your way is better, you know, things like that. Yeah. We learned yeah. a lot from him and, um, but I, he had been there 13 years, and I think he just, he'd done it. 
Yeah, I did a great I get job. it. But I knew that I wanted to bring a lot of things to the table. I knew that I had an abundance of passion for it. And I I got myself involved in everything. I I've um, created some little musical soundscapes that at certain key moments in the set will play to fill dead air and create a okay. sense of um, I've done some small amounts of uplighting on the stage to add a little bit of dramatic effect when the blackouts happen. I, mean, I just one of the things that that every I tune into a lot is staging an experience. And when I watch you guys, it's like, yes, there's great musicianship great vocals, great parts, but you're, you're really, you're like Cirque du Soleil. You're, you're bringing together this glue, this, this spirit, this tone, this energy that, you know, happened once and they were fantastic. They were maybe the best. You guys I really tune into the experience and you pull that experience together, which is ephemeral and tricky and non-tangible a lot okay. of times. See, I'm a, I'm an also, I'm an old theater guy. Right. I actually studied Shakespeare in London at one point. I live for classical theater mm. really, along with music. And for me, Zeppelin is classical theater. For me, it's, these are almost mythological figures. So you want to have all the hammer of the gods thing. You want to have a bit of, for me, a bit of spookiness. You may have noticed yeah. Paige did this but i have some candles on top of the amps i have um you know like a banner of king richard the lionheart over one of my cabs just to kind of impart some of that sort of um you know sort of the the uh i hate the, the word on brand what's that i hate the word on brand but that's <laughs> you know yes, it, um it, I like things that Pagey might have done, but didn't. Right. Hmm. Things so you're that, taking some license. Absolutely. And, and I wear the full dragon suit often, which we had made when I joined the band. But I also make my own Jimmy Page hmm. outfit based on his idea. My thing is when I'm playing, especially, you know, I want people to get a comment. You, look, you watch Pagey on Song Remains the Same or any good old uh, footage of him. He has a wonderful combination of characteristics in his personality. Hmm. What, what I've noticed some tribute players to Paige do is they they adopt the role, but for me, sometimes it's a little too hard, which means it's almost as if they're doing the role as if there was no audience. They're doing it as if they wanted to be so precise to Jimmy, but... Jimmy's personality on stage was not hidden. Sometimes you get this kind of hidden thing from players. That's part of it. Jimmy yeah. would hide under yeah, his yeah. handle, and during some songs, there was a very spooky quality, and I want that in there. Believe sure. me, I want the okay. sorcerer very much a part of it. But Jimmy laughed a lot on stage. Jimmy had a great, charming smile. He would get people revved up. He He's always cheerleading. You watched yeah. it beginning of Moby Dick on Song Remains the Same. Look closely on the wide shot, and Jimmy's going like this to John Baum. He's getting that crowd whipped up. He was a master showman. And that quality of guitar players from that time is what I is something I love because it's real showmanship. It's performance. Right. Look, you go to see a dude like Bill Kirchin. You go to see a dude, you know, you can still see great guitar showmen, but it's a little bit of a lost art in terms of popular culture. That right. pumping the guitar, you know, behind the, all that shit that all those guys used to do. It, it's a strange commodity, but I Stevie, Stevie Ray had some of right. that. I mean, we he, he, do he that anymore. we don't encourage guitar yeah. players to do that. Right. Yeah. So James, let me ask you about the architecture of Jimmy Page, obviously on record, he's a studio musician. He's a producer, right? So there's the the baritone guitar. There's the Nashville tune guitar, maybe a mandolin up top, a couple of electrics, a couple of acoustics, like 10 parts. You're live. You're, you're one human guy. How do you pick the winner? How do you, how do you pick your part? I mean, obviously, there are some of those anthem parts that you just have to play. But but the beauty of Page was an orchestrator, an arranger. Um, 
here's a good example of how I would approach that. All right, you said there's obviously the iconic stuff you have to play. Well, there sure is. <laughs> I mean, I I take a certain amount of creative license at certain points in the set, maybe towards the end of one of the live solos. I'll go from really nailing exact parts that he played to say more following his roadmap or taking a motif and strangling it or turning it inside out. So I definitely allow myself creative license um, with the parts here and there. But you need to nail iconic parts, right? But the sure. uh, irony being, Jimmy didn't always nail the iconic parts mm -hmm. live. The best example for me is the live version of Stairway to Heaven. Um, maybe the most iconic song of the 70s. And his solo in there is really good, but it doesn't include this. It doesn't include the Dia, Dia, which is, how can you leave that out, Jimmy Page? Right, right. So that's a good example of a solo where I wasn't quite sure what to do with it. Zoso had been doing it, the, stair, the song remains the same way for a long time with John. And I just didn't like it. I didn't like, frankly, I don't really love that solo for Page. Parts of it I love, but... Taken as a whole, I felt that that solo could use more. First of all, that it could have been tighter. I felt it was a little too long for a live audience in 2024, 23, 22. But I also wanted to get that part back in. So I basically created a hybrid of parts from the studio album. So important because our ears are waiting for it. Right, right. The audience waiting for certainly the opening licks. Right. But then as you get into it, I was like, well, I want to weave this together. So I took parts from Song Remains the Same, from the live album, from the studio album. I went to Earl's Court. Mm. John McDaniel said, go to Earl's Court. You're going to hear these things. And I had seen John, and I saw that he there was a part that he pulled in that goes. <laughs> it's basically Paige just sort of mandolining the major yeah. triad, the triads of the chord progression. Uh, that's in the Earl's Court version from 75. So mm -hmm. sometimes I will create a hybrid arrangement. I brought it back to the band. They had some ideas about maybe added extra four bars here of it there. And let's, you know, and eventually before too long, we had found, I think, a really, really strong arrangement of that solo um, that that makes sense keeps people keeps the story of that solo going whatever the solo is trying right, to right. say as little chapters um and that's kind of what i've been doing um i'm very exact about most of the solos uh you know black dog obviously it has to be i mean you you know and i'm exact with it that in a way that actually goes right down to the, it's not necessarily always about just playing the notes. It's each note. <laughs> Jimmy's amount of micro bends. Right, right. It, right? His, the way he tails notes. Sometimes his, his tail will be like a, or a very faded tail. Jimmy's Jimmy has these incredible idiosyncrasies in his playing. But the more you learn those solos note for note, like I did, you it's just like learning a language. You've mm -hmm. been reading and studying a French textbook, <laughs> and all you can say from the textbook is phrases. And you get pretty good at the French phrases. Mm -hmm. But eventually you get so deep into the language and the vocabulary, and your accent gets better, that you can just start talking to people. Yeah. And they still think you're speaking Jimmy Page. Right. And I mean, yeah. they're literally here, Jimmy Page, because that's what you're doing. I know that if I play certain figures of pages, um, especially, you know, a lot of these things, the types of solos he plays that use the major and minor pentatonic together, you'll, you hear that all the time in British blues playing, American blues playing too, but the Brits really found, really seem to just love the... Just like Robbie Krieger. That or or Clapton. Uh, that 
thing is very page. And once you know the materials and the palette, essentially, there's so much you can do with page, which is part of what makes him fun. Um, page, I remember, love big improviser. I and love how you, you, you pull from the record, the live shows, kind yep. of past, present, and future. Like you say, okay, what might have Jimmy Page played in the spirit of? Yeah. You know, which you pro probably he didn't never played, but you're able to take that license and that creativity and go, this is, this is in the spirit of, and it works. Yeah. But <laughs> you need the foundation of knowing it note for note cold. Yeah. And I yeah. did the effing work. Right. And you should, in this place, there were post it notes everywhere up and down the stairs, every transcription book folded out on the floor. Six different video windows were up. Mm -hmm. I mean, I deep as I could. To be honest, there were a few people online teaching page that got me started um, who I thought were really incredible. I highly recommend anyone who is interested in learning this stuff. If you're going online for videos to learn, I highly recommend um, this dude named Sped Spedding. And okay. I believe he's a brilliant dude, and he's funny as hell. He's very, very bright. And um, he, he like me, this stuff is scripture to him. And he'll even pick up the, the great book of Zeppelin, kind of, and, you know, read you passages from the stories behind the songs. He was incredibly helpful for me with things like the solo to uh, Achilles' Last Stand, mm -hmm. which is such a beautiful solo. Um, Absolutely. So he was actually my favorite online teacher. But then, of course, a lot of the hard work is just sitting down and hashing it out by ear because you can't trust every source. Right. So, like, so James, like, were you did you did you come up with Jimmy Page as your. Like you were patterning and that was your guy, Jimmy Page, or was Jimmy Page one of a handful of people? Well, and I think that thing about this is he was not yes sure i can include him with with eddie van halen and Jimi hendrix and jeff beck and richie blackmore those are and peter frampton hmm. though that might be my holy five if it's five but yeah. jimmy i have to say jimmy is the preeminent player in my life right. he's preeminent because it's not just about guitar with page pages and page, jimmy page is an intellectual Jimmy Page is a serious intellectual. Hmm. He's an art collector. He is a avid reader. He is interested in alchemy and the occult and just broadly philosophy, metaphysics. Right. Uh, he's a traveler, even very young, even well before Zeppelin. He got himself to India. I mean, this is a guy, this is an immensely curious guy. Paul and Nath kind of guy. My two big heroes, I have to say, were Jim Morrison and Jimmy Page. And one of them was a guitarist and one of them wasn't. But to me, they were the most interesting men in rock music. Mm. And that's what I really like. Mm. And so Page, I often was like a father figure to me. Right, right. He played a very important... My dad was wonderful, sensitive, hardworking, really good man. But my dad was a, was a, was a chief engineer on a destroyer in the Navy. You know, he wanted me to get a buzz cut. And here's Jimmy right. Page walking out with his hair down to here and poppies all over his white open shirted, you know. Yeah. I mean, a lot of us were just like, who are these men? Uh, and I do use the word men specifically here just because even today, I think for young men, men in their teens and the same way for women in their teens with the women they look up to. Who are you going to be? Right. What is adulthood? How do you get there? Um, is there a way to do it that's not maybe as right as, as what you're told it could be? And I guess for me, Paige was that guy too. Because I just loved every, I love everything about Paige. I, I loved his style. I loved, I still, you know, I've been modeling myself after him even sort of physically for years. It's, it's yeah, yeah. I mean, loosely. But that's why when I put on the Jimmy Page clothes, it's like, yeah, whatever. I, I've already kind of. Yeah. I, I've just always, yeah, I've always admired and loved him. And so when Philip Shouse of uh, Accept, Rodney Atkins, Gene Simmons Band, et cetera, 
recommended me to Zoso, to Bevan Davies, the drummer in particular. I mean, I was delighted. Phil was like, you know, they had a guy they were looking at, but he kind of, you know, he didn't come through for them or he's sticking with his old band. You think you might be interested? I'm like, are you kidding me? I mean, this is, this is it. Even when yeah. I was an actor, I used to say, God, Jimmy Page, that would be the role. Because that's everything. That's everything. It really, uh, people, I had a guy say to me recently, like, well, I mean, don't you feel a little odd that, you know, pretty much all you do is go out there and copy Jimmy Page? Mm. I was like, excuse me? <laughs> what? Not that way at all. Right. I- 100% authentic doing this. It's So it's, so what do what do people get wrong about this? Cuz it sounds to me like you're there's a reverence and an honor that you are stepping into those shoes. Huge. To do that. It's not a uh It's not a you know, vomit in the back of your mouth. Oh, he's he's, you know, he thinks he's this, you know. What what do people get wrong? And mistake well, about because you you said it well and you said you know about sort of evoking the atmosphere of it and the way it feels so well i do want them to feel this sort of you know dark page because page has a lot of darkness around him as well as light and explosiveness and all those things i also you know want to make sure that i'm very present in that venue in that theater that night with that audience yeah. I want to be good to them. So right. I try to keep it. I think people know. I mean, I do a lot of very sort of, you know, sometimes almost, you know, the old kind of seductive thing where you kind of shake your butt a little at the odd, you know, that kind of like you bend a note and it's, you give yeah. a little, you know, but I do it with a smile on my face. And I, I think people get that I'm having a terrific time yeah. with this stuff because it is 2024. And some of those old rock god cliches became maybe a little bogus to the culture. Squeeze the lemon. Yeah. Yeah. So I do want to do it with a smile on my face and uh, 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 some kind of bridge there so that the yeah. audience we're playing in front of loves it. They feel engaged. They feel in the now. They're getting all the Zeppelin goodness they love, but they're not looking at a museum. You know, they're looking at people. You know, yeah, I want yeah. them that, we're, that I'm a person, you know. Yeah. What? Hey everybody, just wanted to drop in again and say thanks to our sponsor, The Sync Center. The Sync Center is trusted by Fortune 50 companies, filmmakers, ad executives, networks, major film and streaming studios. The Sync Center is a full service music supervision and licensing company that has managed projects for clients including national and global brands, ad agencies and cultural events. They specialize in getting you the music you want within the budget you have all while keeping you legal through the whole process. You can check them out at thesyncenter.com. That's T-H-E-S-Y-N-C-C-E-N-T-E-R.com. Check them out. What I come away with, James, is that you're doing, this is 2024, most people never saw a Zeppelin, right? So... There's a mythology of like, oh, yeah, Led Zeppelin was it before the Eagles and Van Halen. Like that was that was it. Right. So you're doing you're almost a carrier of that tone, that spirit, that energy. You're you're bringing it into 2024, 2030, you know, the future. It's like those the kids that see you and come to your shows. And I say and they- kids, but, you know, 20 to 30, whatever they are. they have missed some of the greatest moments in rock music. Yeah. And they'll ne- they'll never they may never come back, but you're actually kind of bringing them on a silver platter the experience that you know, how do you put a price tag on that? Is it 20 bucks for a ticket, 40 bucks for a ticket? It's like you're you're getting to step back into time and time travel a little bit. So I, I think I think you guys are doing a, a great service in just saying, look, you know, Rock bands today, good luck. Yes, go for it. But the bands, Hendrix, Van Halen, Zeppelin, it's like, how do you even, where do you start? You know, it's funny because when I first, I sent Zoso a little audition tape. And I think it's important to 
be a, to be always ready to do this. You never know when you're going to get a call about a gig. You mm -hmm. just don't. <laughs> so when you get a call about a gig, try to get them something right away. I knew it would be a few weeks before I would actually rehearse with them. But I wanted to at least just when I got rec the recommendation, I decided, let me send them, send them something tomorrow. So I just, just much like this, I set up a camera yeah. and I threw a bunch of the licks. But I also talked to the guys. I didn't know them real at the time, but I just I, the, the first thing out of my mouth, uh, John, was. And by the way, thank you. I think you've been doing a service to the culture. Mm. Amen. I mean, I, and every that's night kind of it. We the get, guitar playing is great. But we get it's the service all night. People, the people who might have seen Zepp are incredibly grateful. Um, kids and by kids, I mean, sometimes, you know, people bring their 10 year olds, 11 year olds. You know, and it's the cutest. I have a okay. son, so I absolutely love it when there are young kids there, too. But there's a lot of gratitude because I think people know we take it seriously. Mm -hmm. But we're also fun and we're pretty darned exacting about this. I mean, mm -hmm. the, you know, there's a question in my mind sometimes about what is exact. Because everyone who does this role of Jimmy Page, Anthony David from Led Zeppelin, he's excellent. Steph Paines from Les Zeppelin, excellent. Gretchen Men of Zepparella is excellent. Uh, Jimmy Sakurai of uh, Jason Bono's band, he's excellent. I mean, these are all really fine players, and everybody seems to have, I think, ev of course, everyone has a unique take on how to do this. There is no one way to do Jimmy Page. Mm -hmm. I truly believe there's a most exact way, and that's partly because Page is just so expansive. He He's right. so broad. And even just the range of tones between the albums and live is so broad that to say you have the Jimmy Page, the only Jimmy Page sound. Yeah. I think you hit it when you said expansive. There's an encyclopedia there. Yeah. Hendrix, Hendrix had it. Yeah. Van Halen, Stevie Ray, Eric Johnson. You know, it's like Pat Metheny has that layers upon layers of depth. I mean, it, it's it's rare. It's a challenge for the player, and you can learn Jimmy Page inside and out. My opinion is it really helps to have some background and something under your under your your fingers in all the genres that Jimmy Page has played that Jimmy Page incorporates into Zeppelin. I've done R and B gigs with horn sections. All right, I've done acoustic gigs, open tuned all the way through. I used to do a Nick Drake tribute show solo. <clears throat> those various tunings and how to play them and sing them. I live in Nashville. I've done my homework on country guitar. Um, Jason Laughlin is a great instructor on truefire.com and other platforms. Great country player who became a, who's become a great friend of mine. I've spent hours and hours with those lessons so that I could get uh, faux pedal steel bends together. Right, right. Chicken pick picking together so that I could get country double stops together. Yeah. That it's I could the get dust. It's you the Jimmy that. Page dust. That, yeah. You know, it was there in the corners, but it, he didn't lead with it. He didn't, you know. It's all in there. In fact, right, people, right. I do not like the characterization of Jimmy Page as a blues guitar player. That is just utterly and completely untrue. Jimmy yeah. Page was partly a blues player. Maybe he was 20% blues. 35% is country and rockabilly. He's way think, more a rockabilly player, actually, than he is a blues player. Mm, true. He really, and, of course, he was a terrific acoustic player, terrific funk player on songs like The Crunge, and funk is everywhere in Zeppelin. Right, right. This CD is a funk album. Mm. <laughs> Little secret. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Those guys were into funk, man. They were into James Brown and the JBs and Parliament. and Yeah. Right. It's, it's for me if you were lucky enough as i was <clears throat> to have been a session player in new york city that's this is a big reason why i think i can do this mm -hmm. is because i have played many many different styles and i've had to wear different hats so coming to page was like holy shit i get to use all these vocabularies right together it's magic man yeah yeah it really is with with there are there are no accidents yeah, with in half that, the of, a, of a rock player in 2024 or less. Yeah. When I joined yeah, yeah. the band, Jay, could you take your gain down a little more? I'm like, really? 
oh boy, really? So I took the gain on the Marshall down, taking it like, oh, because <laughs> then you're starting to feel a little, a little more naked, right? Because rock yeah. players we cover up with gain and delay and stuff all the time. Yeah, but on yeah. this, I had a, I'm selective about how I use my delays. I use a bunch of them, but they're all smaller. It's not the edge. I'm not, you know. Yeah. And then with the gain, yeah, it's you know, you listen, it's pretty clean by today's standards. Those yeah. solo, I don't get a lot of, you know, I don't have that legato Steve Vai, you know, type of Boogie. distortion. Yeah. yeah. Hey everybody, it's John. Just wanted to drop in here and give a special thanks to our sponsor, Artist Works. Artist Works is an execution company. They specialize in media, marketing, and monetization. ArtistWorks partners with brands to provide infrastructure, marketing, execution, and monetization in the rapidly changing media industry. They create products and experiences to engage your customers, drive revenue, build careers, and surpass your competitors. Check them out at ArtistWorks.com. That is works with a W-E-R-X. A-R-T-I-S-T-W-E-R-X.com. So James, we talked the other day about a sidecar approach. You've lived in the magazine world, the tribute world, music as a career. Let's talk about the sidecar approach that that we hit on the other day. I think we we might have used the metaphor of <clears throat> You know, we're all used to picking up a, a novel, a very well-known novel, maybe, and reading it. And then the, as we get to the back, we think, wow, this this author, uh, author must live in a you know a mansion somewhere just based on their books. Then you find out, oh, no, 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 they're, they're, they've been a teacher at Princeton for the last 15 years. They have other things they do. Cre your creative output is not always going to support you. It just isn't. It might. Yeah. And even artists who seem very well established... Um, uh, I, I'll put it this way, unless you're on a major label, unless you're um, really raking in big money on some very uh, more mainstream version of music, you're going to probably want to pair your creative projects with projects that can help make you money and earn you income um, uh, in the field. Yeah. This is a tricky thing. Now... <laughs> There Not directly, are, but kind it's of tricky because there are people who, and I think I've done this myself. We enter a field that we love because presumably we want to be artists, but we may find ourselves shifting into a job that is in the field, but not necessarily being an artist. You know, you may be a painter and you find yourself with a, a really good administrative job at an art institute or an art college. Um, you Nothing may, wrong with that. You know what I mean? Yeah. You need to be careful. There's a phrase that I've always, I forget when I was acquainted with it called the shadow artist. And that is a thing where we, we're going for what we really want, but we also need to make a living. So sometimes we support ourselves by things that are a little bit in the shadows of what it is right. we most do. And there's a balance there because you can, you could potentially maybe get lost there. Or maybe you lose a little of the drive for that number one thing that it is that you want. But all that said, I think it's important to be able to perform different tasks within your field, basically. Um, yeah. I am very lucky that I've been writing about music all these years because the pandemic being such a good example. I didn't do a show for 20 months. Mm. My income from touring which was pretty decent oh. at the time, went away. I right. was not a member of at this time. I was a member of a band called The Cringe with some yeah. wonderful New York musicians. Uh, and I did really well with that thing. But when that went away, touring income gone. Right. 80% of my income gone. We all went through this type of thing in 2020. My pivot, such as it is, was, damn, well, I better call up my friends at the magazines and get working again start doing some writing. And I did have yeah. that pocket and it's yeah. always there. Um, plenty of touring musicians are also real estate agents. Totally common. Yeah. Uh, I think of it as chapters. It's like yeah. 
we, we tend to be maybe a little diva esque and saying, you know, I want to be Steve Lukather, and that's the only thing I'm going to be, studio guy, right? Or yeah, Taylor Swift's guy. But it's like the path to get there, like your time at guitar player, wasn't a waste of time. It was actually serving and backfilling for what you're doing now. Absolutely, man. And I I now have a lot of faith in that. I felt yeah. conflicted at the time right. off because I wasn't on the road from 91 to 97. I was an editor, a guitar player, but it was incredibly fulfilling and important work and made me a better player and better thinker, better writer, better human, I think. Um, yeah. But it, it you do eventually find out that there was sort of uh, some plan here. Yeah. Uh, but I guess I would say, don't be too stubborn. <laughs> right. Um, right. If you're, say, working really hard on your original project, um, and you that's what you really want to make happen. You want to get that thing signed, you know, that go for it. Believe in it. However, just also, you know, if, say, a name artist comes along and says, hey, we'd love to have you come play drums with us or play guitar, be our guitar player. We'll be on the road for about six months to eight months, you know, so it'll take away a little from your original project. Go make some money. Do the math, you right. know, just do the math, uh, the, the moral math, do the spiritual math, uh, the economic math, like just yeah. take a look at the big picture. Will it really hurt me if at age 24, I take this gig for six months and don't pay all my attention to my original project? Probably not. But then again, that's up to you. If things are yeah. hot as a soon and you think things are going to connect in the next few months you may not want to risk that if yeah. a if, if a show you know i lived in new york so i and of course had a lot of friends on broadway who played broadway and um you know one friend was offered a 14 month touring gig with a broadway show well i was in a band with him mm -hmm. and he didn't make this decision strictly up because of the band, but he decided not to take that pretty lucrative 14 month thing because he had so many things in New York that he wanted to pay attention right. to it would have taken him away for a good 14 months. Another player of mine said, you know what, this is a really good idea for me. It's going to add a massive tick on my resume. Um, it's going to be a proving ground for me. It's going to sharpen me. You know, every gig should give you something. You right. should get, you should make some money or, you should make some really good connections. Got to be something. Yeah, you know, it may not 100%. pay as a gig, but the gig that pays you eight hundred bucks a day may be golden handcuffs, and the gig that pays you two hundred dollars a day may open all kinds of doors. Yeah, I would 100%. just it's important to keep your eyes open and and stay humble, which is easy to do in Nashville because everybody's so <laughs> damn good. <laughs> That's <a> freaking. <laughs> Will come up to me night after night, James. You're playing with you know. I'm like, oh, well, thank you, you know. And I sometimes say to them, by the way, I can't get a big head because I live in Nashville. Hundred percent. There's hundred percent like in walking distance of here who are just beasts. So, so, <laughs> so James, tying into that, the seventeen year old kid coming up today. You know, we say it a lot, you know, one person's hindsight is the next person's foresight. What do you tell that kid? Record industry's gone. There's tons of mythology online. Distractions are everywhere. What do you have any points, anything to install in that 17 year old kid that can yeah, help him or her? I do. I do. I do. I think. And I think. What I really have to instill is is two different, two slightly opposing um, values that you want to hold on to simultaneously. Mm -hmm. One of them is I'm 17, 18, 19. I've written some really great songs. I love these songs. I think they're really effing good. And or and I've got a band that's really actually effing good. I know there's no guarantees in this business, but. There must be part of you that is absolutely like a pile driver in a given direction. If right. you believe in yourself, especially at a young age, because you have latitude and we can say the record industry is gone, but it ain't gone for people your age. It ain't gone for 17 and 18 and 19 year olds. Right. You're arguing the ones who have the best chances of getting signed and having a long career. It still happens. 
and it can still happen for you. You've also got all this wonderful, all these wonderful tools. I don't just mean social media, but I also mean that the kind of apps for video and audio, et cetera, that could help you get your music out there looking and and great. All these things are to your advantage. So I guess one part of you should just be an absolute um, maniacal, just maniacal, obsessive. I'm going to get this done the way I want to get it done, because that dream is not impossible by any means. It can happen. And uh, what did David Lee Roth used to say? Stay frosty, my friends. (laughs) And what he meant by that, I believe, is, is that keep a certain cold surgical quality to what you do as well know that Mm -hmm. also need to support yourself know that you don't want to live in your own mythology right you want to remain a good human being and you don't Mm want to alienate everyone from your life because you're so obsessive yeah so carry yourself as a grown-up and a fascinated child who wants to be that's good at the same time Mm -hmm. because if you put all into your i'm a special creative child and i will rule the world you could end up a monster. In, yeah. And you could end up in some trouble. Keep, keep yourself grounded and know that there are practical things in terms of doing this, as well as sort of things that might be part of this myth of, of uh, sort of stardom or whatever. I'd be very careful about stardom. Mm. Very careful about it. I would really inquire into why you even want to be a star in the first place mm. I'm not saying it's wrong to want to be a star i'm just saying do some self-inquiry um and make sure that the star part is not your priority right you must if you want to be a successful original musician and you're young you need to be writing all the time you need to improve your songs i guarantee you you may think those songs you're writing are great 17 to 22 but unless you're really a phenom you got to keep working on those tunes man you 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 got to make your songs better and better and better it doesn't matter how good your band looks or how appropriate your style is people can argue that songwriting is not what it used to be it has changed and the expectations of a song have changed um hip-hop definitely changed songwriting as we know it even in country music we hear the mm-hmm. effects of that um but make sure those songs are good. Make sure those lyrics are good. Um, pay attention to your your craft. You know, craft, craft, craft. Somebody once said. Um, That's good, James. Yeah, really pay attention to your craft. Try to in Buddhism, it's sometimes called equanimity. Keep a poise. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Keep yourself level. Have your wild dreams of driving a Maserati around your chateau in the Loire Valley. God knows I had them. <laughs> <laughs> but also make sure that you're, you know, you're measured and you're responsible. You know, be be a good being a good person will actually make you a better player, believe it or not. hundred percent. That's great, James. James, this has been fantastic, man. We'll have to do this again. I mean, I th- I think. There is such, you hit on David Lee Roth, just as we're buttoning up here. There is such a philosophy behind some of his quips that if you're drunk, partying, whatever, you miss those things. But there is some wisdom in David Lee Roth that is significant. (laughs) I quite agree. I think he was an amazing philosopher. And remember, you know, he was a student of martial arts and this right, and that. Right. He was exceedingly high IQ person. Right. Roth. Somebody, and- somebody's going to write that book, The Philosophy of David Lee Roth. Absolutely. Many funny <laughs> Many quips, yeah. Uh, I always remember growing, growing up, the reason Dave was so great, I'll try to make this quick, is because, look, as much as I, I worship Jimmy Page, but, you know, an interview with Jimmy Page or some British rock, you know, royalty. But we, we, we did the tracks, you know, the tr- and the first few times with the overdubs was a bit spotty maybe. And we, but David Lee Roth would get on the radio for an interview and he's talking about it, how he used to jog but the ice cubes kept falling out of his drink. Uh, he just would light you up with personality. Uh, 100%. And, and look, there is nobody in my mind, in my experience, there's nobody touches van halen and obviously eddie was 
the dri- a driver in that, the creative force, we'll say. But I think people tend to underestimate the value that David Lee Roth lyrically, melodically, like he brought like a lot of the parts, Diver Down, Van Halen 2, Women and Children First. It's like some of the music parts that Eddie would bring were very odd, kludgy type things. So melodically, how you find, how you're tasked with writing lyrics and melody to that. David Lee Roth is an amazing songwriter for him to bring out that top line experience of Van Halen. It's significant. And uh, yes, the guitar hysterics are impressive and tappy, tappy, tap, tap, but the songs of Van Halen, they're incredible. Compositional level gets missed. So maybe we'll come back and do a, a, a... Oh my God, we could do that for days Dude. too. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Van Halen. Been... Was... Hey everybody, just wanted to drop in again and say thanks to our sponsor, The Sync Center. The Sync Center is trusted by Fortune 50 companies, filmmakers, ad executives, networks, major film and streaming studios. The Sync Center is a full service music supervision and licensing company that has managed projects for clients including national and global brands, ad agencies and cultural events. They specialize in getting you the music you want within the budget you have all while keeping you legal through the whole process. You can check them out at thesyncenter.com. That's T-H-E-S-Y-N-C-C-E-N-T-E-R.com. Check them out. I, I used to wear the suspenders and the little... <laughs> I, I used to do Eddie to the bone. Oh, Back really? The, I... I, it wasn't a Van Halen tribute. I would, I just wanted to look like Eddie as well. I, you know, these role models or these these heroes we've had over the years. You know, we used to have what we call guitar heroes, kids. Right. Uh, they weren't just guitar players to mm. us. They were they were special people, and we wanted to be like them. The and, key word, James, is hero or heroic. That yeah. I think, as you're talking about your dad who was fantastic and awesome and was an engineer, the heroic that occasionally comes through our universe, the Van Halens, the Hendrix, the Jimmy Pages, there is a Greek mythology kind of thing there. Uh, Beyond the music, beyond the guitar, it's like there's a heroism is a, big thing that I think is what we're talking about, but we can't really put a finger on in, there's in great, this. There's a great book came out in the early seventies uh, called the making of a counterculture uh, by an author named Theodore Rozak. We happen to have it around the house because my mother was a philosophy and religion mm-hmm. scholar. And uh, in this book, he has a wonderful quote. That I never forgot. I read it very young, you know, um, And it was today's youth, and he was speaking about late 60s, early 70s culture. Today's youth basically are not satisfied with the kind of uh, course that that previous generations have set for them. Get a good job, the American dream, etc. They want to, he said, they want to live mythically and in depth. Mm. And if you look at that generation, you see that. You watch the Doors movie. Come on, Jim, we're going to make the myths. Hmm. Mythic quality was a big part of 60s counterculture that fed into 70s. And it's what made rock big. Yes. And it's what punk come along and puncture it. True. True. And that was all meant to happen. Yeah. But you know, I, I'm still pretty happy with the, <laughs> the mythic guys. I really am. Yeah. So thanks for letting me, uh, you know, <laughs> as you can see, I'm one of those interview subjects where you wind me up and I pretty much go. No, dude, that that's all good. It's like the 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 binary conversation of, you know, rock star or oversimplifying things. It really doesn't do a, a service to the conversation. There's a lot of moving parts. And, you know, if we do our job well, we tell the story in a way that, you know, pulls here pulls you know it's like there's nothing's an accident so 
no. And and you can you can man, I, I mean, you can fulfill your dreams in this business. They may just you may not it may not be exactly you know the way you envisioned it. It may just be a little different. I mean, dude, when I see those pictures people take of me at, at our shows, and it's like, you know, they're just they're shots that if I saw them when I was a kid of someone else, I'd think, wow, this guy is, this is the hammer of the gods itself. You know, I see those photos and I just think, Jesus Christ, in, in some way I've really fulfilled my dreams. Right. That vision was something I really had. I wanted to be that guy. Yeah. And I get it. Now, no, I don't drive a Ferrari, but I have a very nice 2023 Acura Integra. Thank you very much. Nothing and wrong I, with that. I have a beautiful eight year old boy and, responsibilities and a normal life yeah in addition to that so that i don't know it's a tough thing i don't even know if i explained it well but i guess no i think you did and and, and there's there's things people just get so wrong with musicianship and and the career path it's like it there's yeah. such a technicolor ideal and it's like man it's about loving your family it's about loving your kid it's about paying off your house that's the shit that is like you know, let's go invest in an artist. Let's go invest in this. Let's go build the future that doesn't exist yet. That's what excites us. It's like the the playbook, the dinosaur record label world, the legacy world that is, if it's not dead yet, it will be in the next 18 months. It's like that's gone away. So we have the opportunity to create the playing field we wished for you know it, it doesn't exist anymore nashville is where we show people the way yeah I'm telling you because this is the only town in the country in which it is fully understood that music is a perfectly wonderful middle class existence or can yeah. be for and you can make better choices than the rock stars made right and you can own a home and have a family and be a good person and have your dreams come true as a player, but still have a real life. Um, we're the right. only one to show people the way, because in the rest of the country, they still ask you stupid questions, you know? Right. They're you know buying I mean? the Technicolor poster. And it's they, like, yeah, that that hip hop poster, that heavy metal poster. Or that's, a, that's a myth. You're lying in the gutter with a bottle of Thunderbird. They just don't yeah. understand it. Music middle class. You could work for a man, uh, um, equipment manufacturing, and then tour on weekends. You can, yeah. you can be a writer and tour every weekend. You can, do you know what I mean? You can get your original record, great recognition, great reviews. You can do wonderful shows and still come back, and you have your sidecar to pay off your mortgage every month because original music doesn't always do that for us. Right. I mean, there's so many. Nashville shows the way, dude. I'm, I, yeah. I really, no, I'm with you. And it's the last song town, you know, that is songwriter yeah. that's baked in our DNA. Absolutely, man. I'm so glad I moved here. I, I've, I really am. And I, I feel I really would have missed out if I had, if I had not come South, if I had not come to Nashville. Yeah. I mean, you, you've, you've lived a really interesting story. So James, tell us, tell us kind of about how'd you get here? Where'd you, where'd, where'd you start out and. Tell us your backstory. I have been the editor in chief of two magazines that were under the same family as Guitar World and Guitar Player are now. That is Future Network, or uh, which is sort of the umbrella company. And that was a magazine. One magazine was called Future Music, mm -hmm. which was going on here for about, I think we did it for about seven years uh, between about 2005. 2010 something like that in those years um and uh at the time i was the senior editor of guitar world magazine i had actually come over from i had moved to new york from san francisco in 2003 um where i had been the eventually the senior editor of um guitar player magazine and that was during a wonderful era for the magazine under people like uh, joe gore was the one of the editor was was the editor in chief there Richard Johnson was editor in chief there. Michael Melinda was the editor in chief there during that period. Uh, I came along in ninety um, one as sort of a young pup, um, 
assistant editor and it's just sort of my good fortune to move to San Francisco in the Bay Area at the very time the guitar player was looking for a younger editor, basically. They yeah. wanted someone who could give them a little in touch with this whole crazy thing that was happening with alternative rock and yada right, yada. Right. You know, guitar player had such a a great uh, pedigree and had done so many things. And they had a guitar player named Joe Gore, um, later the guitar player actually for PJ Harvey and Tom Waits and Tracy okay. Chapman, um, nice. was also a brilliant guitar journalist. And he was at the magazine then, and he was really bringing in a lot of new life himself, covering everything from Richard Thompson to African guitar and avant-garde guitar and stuff. Uh, my role when I came in was sort of good timing because I kind of walked in when the Pearl Jams and the Nirvanas and mm -hmm. and then all those little shoegazer bands and right. brilliant little sort of what? punk dog bands like Skeleton Key and other bands we don't necessarily remember now, but we're popping out of the woodwork. The Boo Radleys right. and alternative yeah, yeah. hip hop was going crazy and great things were happening. So, um, so guitar playing was very much at a has been had been disrupted early 90s like the metal bands of the 70s and 80s done it was a sea change right what t talk to talk to me about the culture of being an editor at a guitar magazine because i grew up on guitar player yeah uh, eric johnson issue blah 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 i mean never missed a, an issue for maybe a decade, probably more than a decade. Yeah. What what does that look like inside the sausage factory? Because I mean, nobody really the magazine just appears. It did appear back in the day. I don't know what they are right. now, but uh, what yeah. what is that culture? What is that day to day? It's what funny because I, I sometimes have the feeling that when a magazine arrives for a reader, the reader's just like, "Oh, wow, look at this thing!" It just sort of created itself and <laughs> it showed yeah. up in my every Stork. issue. Every issue is a lot of work. Now, at that time, we had a a very solid staff. Um, I only say this because I still write for the guitar magazines, but their staffs have been cut massively. I mean, back in the day, you know, there would be, for example, Joe Gore, editor-in-chief, the great Jazz Obrecht, associate editor. Oh, my I, goodness. Features editor for a while, uh, you know, move, moving around, features editor, senior editor, etc. We had uh, the great Chris Gill, a guy who'd interviewed everybody from Johnny Cash to Jeff Beck. He was on staff. Like, we had a terrific art director, plus an assistant art director, plus a photo editor. You know, we actually had big In staff house. because of the subsequent decline of the print industry right. over the decades those staffs began to shrink and shrink but back at the time we had a pretty good staff so we could do a lot of writing in-house um and we did have freelancers in fact i brought along many freelancers even sometimes gave freelancers their first story who continue to be excellent um uh, very well-known guitar writers people like michael ross and and others so um mm -hmm. I feel like I was lucky to get in when I did because the guitar magazines had such a fertile atmosphere. So I was on the West Coast at the time with Guitar Player. Yeah. Of course, it was Pepsi to our Coke, but Guitar World. Now, we were competing magazines. Let there be no question about it. Guitar Player and Guitar World were competing. Guitar World at some point, Guitar World, which arrived, as you may remember, sometime around the early 80s. I want to say 81, 82. Um, whereas Guitar Player, I don't know if everyone knows this, but Guitar Player was founded in 1967. It actually predates Rolling Stone. Wow. By a couple of months. In fact, and that was the established go-to yeah. guitar player. Yeah. Tommy Tedesco. I remember Josh that. Albrecht, I mean, all those guys, Mike Varney, they were like. Yes. Guitar Player had sort of established what a guitar magazine was. Yeah. Um, but, um, Harris Publications created Guitar World in 81-ish, and their tilt was at the time maybe a little more towards metal, although not as much as it eventually became. Definitely more identified as a metal magazine. I remember Guitar World having, you know, a terrific cover story with Eddie Van Halen in 1980, 80, 81, but also having stories with, you know, much more inside 
figures like Buzzy Fighton, you know, like yeah. these more side journeyman players would also find their way in there. But here's what I can tell you about being at a guitar magazine. You like at every magazine, you're you are pitched by publicists that month on a bunch of different artists that they believe and they are paid to believe and paid to promote to you as potential candidates for some kind of editorial. Uh, that could be an album review. It could be a full feature story, which goes into detail about them, um, who they are, how they play, what their equipment is, etc. Or it could be very short sometimes, or uh, sometimes with a new band that just got a great player. So you want to give, you want to start building that. You might put that in the upfront section. As you look at any magazine, you notice different sections, so different little, different niches basically that a story may belong in. Uh, and then, of course, the cover story. And the cover story has obviously a huge responsibility of selling the issue on the newsstand. With every magazine, there's basically your subscribers are kind of your your pillar. They're sort of your foundation. And you want to be good to them. And you want to keep them happy. And you want to yeah. keep their subscriptions. So you want to give them really good substantive um, issues month after month. You yeah. also need to think about the newsstand and somebody literally grabbing that issue for whatever reason. And there are all kinds of tricks to that, too. Like, uh, it's well known that numbers work well on the cover. The 101 best guitarists or the 100 greatest solos or the 10 pieces of gear you must own, you know, things right. like that. Those are like basically little editorial techniques that help something carry at the newsstand. Inside the cabal at the magazine, you generally, I mean, back in the day, you know, like I said, we had four or five usually very strong personalities sitting in that, in the editor's office, the editor-in-chief's office, generally sitting around planning issues. In other words, each right. person bringing to, each editor bringing to the table, here are the artists I think we should cover in next month's issue, based on both my own personal sort of reading of the landscape, players who have really struck me players that publicists have hit me about. They might be some young Turk in a new band. They could be some journeyman who's really proven his metal and just put out his, you know, uh, his first solo album in 12 years. But my God, you got to hear this new one by Sonny Landreth. Or yeah. you got to hear this one by David Grissom. Now, these, these are not household names. Or Scott Henderson. Scott Henderson? Much of the public doesn't know who Scott Henderson is, yeah. but... Guitar players bloody well do. Yeah. Um, right. And about I, what I kind of runway do you get for each episode? I always try to, you know, you do try to pull the newsstand. You also don't want to pander. Right. In other words, I remember saying to Joe Gore once, man, just kind of musing back in the 90s. I said, it was like maybe like 96. I was still on staff. And I said, you know, I, I felt that at the time, I remember feeling a little bothered by the fact that people kept saying, would refer to the guitar magazines as tech magazines. That was sort of a, in the industry, they were like the tech magazines. I was like, right, tech? Right. What do you mean tech? Just because we cover equipment or a tech magazine? Guitar right. player artists, you bozos. Yeah. <laughs> but that's how we got pulled. And it started to bother me because the hip magazines, you may remember Ray Gunn, which was mm -hmm. a super hip cool layouts sometimes you could barely read it half the story because the layout was so cool but that was all right you know it had a strong punk and indie ethos right. or whatever i remember saying to joe gore you think there'll ever come a time when you know everyone will be able to read guitar player the same way they read say a rolling stone or, or a spin or something like that and he looked at me sideways and he said god i hope not mm. and i took that on board Guitar magazine culture is different. We have a different mandate. We're, we're, we bring something much different to the readers. And month after month, what we do is we interview artists. That's a big part of it. Interview guitar players. Ask them how they play. Ask them why they play. Ask them what they play. Um, um, ask them who their influences are. Uh, go into detail about their gear. And if they say, oh, yeah, and I use a fuzz pedal for you, you're like, oh, which fuzz pedal right in fact not only which fuzz pedal but which iteration of that particular fuzz pedal we don't we don't let people off scot-free when it comes to talking about gear yeah and in the 90s of course when that sea change happened 
from a lot of these, a lot of players at the time who were doing more grunge or alternative, they would always say, well, you know, I don't really care much about gear. Right. Or I don't care much about technique. Basically, they were trying to differentiate themselves. Too cool for from, school. From the shredder school and caring too much about technique. So there was a lot of this. Uh, and it did get I, ridiculous. I mean, there, there were some total and silliness. Then about that fuzz pedal and you then you'd say well which one and next thing you know they talk for five minutes about how much they love that particular fuzz pedal because all guitar players love gear doesn't matter if you're punk or metal or whatever everyone loves their equipment right uh, so james question for you what what kind of runway went into each episode is that what a kind 60, of 60 day pre-production generally time speaking frame? generally speaking the magazine had what we would call I think I remember it being like a two month lead time. That basically means that from the moment you start that editorial cycle until that magazine is on newsstands, you've probably got about two months, which is to say you've got about a month to put the issue together. And then the, generally it'll hit newsstands in about a month after you go to print, sometimes two weeks or three weeks. It depends. Mm -hmm. But basically you have sort of a lead time. So you do want to, plan issues in advance or at least get a basic outline sometimes you at least want to know what the cover is right go in fine in other words you don't want to come right up to like shit tomorrow's day one of our editorial the beginning of this cycle we don't know who the cover story is right things like that covers who's going to be in the cover you want to nail that down much more in advance early right right yeah and, and an editor-in-chief's job is often to sort of you know put the pins in where he can see where he can see his best route forward. Right. Um, and so, but in terms of the amount of time you actually had to put the issue together, you generally had a little less than a month. <laughs> and you had a spreadsheet essentially with what was in the intro section of the magazine. What was the, what were the small features? What were the album reviews going to be? Or at least here's an album review section. Let's start picking ones for that. Let's pick our two main features. Let's pick our secondary feature, you know, things like that. Yeah, And then you'd get working. And editing, of course, is also copy editing. It's just sitting down with copy. In fact, in the old days, I did it with a pen. We, we'd print it out. We'd do it on computers. We'd write them on computers. We'd print them out, and I'd use copywriting symbols. I still do that today. Mm -hmm. um, I never let a story go out of my home office here without first printing it. Then when, I'm, when it's, I've already edited it and gone through it with a fine-tooth comb and spell check, still... I print it out of my printer, I sharpen my pencil, and I go through and I make actual copy editing symbols because there's things that I miss on the screen right. that I won't miss on paper. 100%. And then process, and eventually you end up with a magazine. And back in the day, especially with all those very, get, you know, I thought very smart, insightful, hardworking guys that we had a guitar player, um, we produced some, I thought, really exceptional issues. Um, mm -hmm. And they were eclectic. Right. So it wasn't metal. It was African guitar and jazz players and metal players and, uh, you know, Sonic Youth, alternate tune noise players. We had everything in right. that. Year. And yeah. I, I remember look at yeah. the time I was at Corner Music in Nashville. Yeah. Teaching there. And man, that was guitar player was kind of the Bible for guitar players. Like you, you, you expected it you devoured it and you waited for the next one. So yeah. Great job, course, man. Transcriptions and all that stuff. Right. In right. Them. So it wasn't just interviews and gear. It was also how to play in the style of Django Reinhardt, how to play in the style of Jeff Beck, um, you know, um, and it was a very fun culture. And frankly, our guitar players um, rivalry with guitar world was a lot of fun. We were, we knew those cats, you know, we'd bump shoulders yeah. at, shows we'd go out to drinks together you know we but it was rivalry until years later um they came under the same corporate umbrella as they are now uh which we right. always said coke and pepsi hell freezing over will never happen right uh, but it did and i'm glad it did because i think those magazines still have a strong role even in the era Absolutely. of endless youtube videos mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so during your time there guitar player and guitar world you probably bumped into, worked with, interviewed some 
famous, interesting, compelling people. Who were some of the people that surprised you? Huh, that's a good question and a good way to put it, I think. You know what I mean? Like, who was like, I did not expect that from that <laughs> person. Um, well, let me start by just saying how incredibly fortunate I was. 100%. At that age, I was, you know, 24, 25. And one of my first big assignments was, was, uh, it was flying to uh, Los Angeles uh, a couple days after New Year's uh, and to interview uh, Eddie Van Halen at 5150 Studios. I mean, I was 26 at the time. And what, what year was this, James? This would have been 93. 93, okay. So end of Sammy Hagar. E, I believe right. Sammy part of the picture at this time and i think the record they were putting out at that time was a live record it was a live right. one with sammy but we decided to do it as kind of a look back as well and and talk about the first sort of you know decade plus of, of van halen um and what was that uh, like it was amazing and actually eddie did surprise me but what surprised me i guess when you know when you have somebody such a big hero to you like he was for so many of us um you hope they're nice. <laughs> mm. And uh, he was more than nice. And that's the thing about Van Halen. I try, I often tell people is like, he was just uh, obviously a deeply troubled person as well. Um, over time became very deeply troubled, but he was fundamentally a, a, a quite modest and um, simple guy. He, he, he was a dude. He was a right. West Coast dude. A kid. You know, like I'm a, like, other people I've interviewed, like Jimmy Page, who I had the opportunity to interview with Brad Talinsky of Guitar World uh, once, or people like, um, and I'm trying to think, but he he wasn't one of he wasn't an intellectual player. Right, he, he didn't get sophisticated or above his no pay he grade. Was, like he was he was he was a gear guy. He was a song guy. He was a song guy, gear guy. He loved guitar. He loved Holdsworth, but he was mm. a simple. Yeah, he didn't he wasn't trying you know he often said i speak through my guitar i don't really have that much to say that said you know our interview was amazing and to be able to sit knee to knee with eddie van halen and he's noodling on a guitar and i'm noodling on a guitar right next to each other and drinking okay. heineken right i think we did that for a good five hours oh, wow. um, and it was at the studio in kind of the lounge area and the, the, the real surprise was that i went away feeling really good and i was you know you worry meeting your heroes if you're going to go away not feeling good, but I yeah. certainly, um, but everyone interrupt. I mean, James Hetfield surprised me. I interviewed James Hetfield and, um, it's kind of, it's kind of like when you interview them. Yeah. If you, if you interviewed James Hetfield in 81, <laughs> right. Shit, you better get, you better get out of the way. Right. But if you, if you interview him when he got his head together, man, he seems like a really thoughtful connected guy. <laughs> Him, him and Kirk, I remember it was when the album, uh, I think it might have been when Garage Days Revisited came out. Okay. If I have my dates right. Um, I'm trying to think that was the one. And I went to interview them for a cover story, and it was Kirk and James at their big facility, you know, their compound, basically, in, uh, on the, in the North Bay. Right. And, uh, yeah, I was surprised because those guys were actually quite, quite smart guys kirk kirk was a real sophisticate actually you know kirk went through his whole period where he decided i don't want to be a metal guy anymore i want to be steve buscemi <laughs> and you'd i would see kirk around at night in san francisco i'd go to the elbow room sometimes i'd be sitting in there on kind of like a you know a sort of a, a jazz sort of grant green sort of mm. tilted gig and, oh. and kirk would be and i'd be sitting in with somebody and kirk kirk would be out there like you know, sipping a martini and wearing his two-tone shoes and stuff, you know. Um, nice. So I actually did rub shoulders with a lot of Bay Area people Yeah, uh, often. And that's part of how I ended up um, being introduced to Mike Patton and being asked to join Mr. Bungle hmm. towards nice. the tail of my years with uh, with Guitar Player Magazine. It was just, hmm. I was on the scene, basically. and What a different band. I'll say, yeah, yeah. Holy moly. Wow. 
present. James, this has been fantastic, man. Thank you again for jumping in and joining us and having this conversation. I mean, there's a, a ton of experiences that you bring that I think the next generation of artists, if they listen to what you're saying, can really be served well by. So thank right. you so much, my, my brother. Pleasure. Thank you, John. I really appreciate it, man. Talk to you soon. Okay.